Well, um, afternoon folks. Um, here for the afternoon session. We have Jessica Pani all the way from Namibia to tell us all about um, <laughs> <laughs> what she's been doing there in the way of um, Python and education. I had a chat with her last night. It all sounds very interesting. Okay, so uh, Jessica, take it away. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for being here this afternoon. And also a big thank you to PyCon Zeri for bringing us together this week. Um, in Namibia, we have organized two Python conferences so far, and we are still new in Python. We are hosting our next one in February next year, and so we look up to PyCon ZA. It's a privilege that we are here. So thank you very much for this opportunity. <laughs> so my talk is about practical strides that we can take to ensure Python skills development. Most of these ideas are things that we have carried out in our own country, and also some ideas that are being carried out around other countries in Africa. And this, I hope, this talk will encourage more other African countries to also start Python conferences, or even around the world. If you don't have a Python conference in your country yet, I hope that this will encourage you to have one. Okay. So, um, in any area that you are in, if you want to start developing or developing the skills of your society, it's very important that you um, find out first what area is not presented in the computing environment or in the computing industry. Which area is underrepresented? So knowing that will give you a guidance as to which areas you should focus on or what um, initiatives you should focus on. And in Namibia, the areas that are, or the people that are underrepresented are women and children in our education or in our, our IT industry. So we have come up with some initiatives that will empower women and also that will reach out to school children. Okay. So uh, one of them, one of the initiatives is Pi Ladies. We have not had this in our own country yet, but Pi Ladies is um, a group of women developers who love writing code in Python. And it's a combination of women who are full-time Python developers or women who just work on Python projects. But what they have in common is wanting to develop software in Python. It can also be people or ladies who don't really have any Python skills but want to work with Python. So that's also one good initiative that you can use to, to um, empower women. This has already been done in Nigeria. Um, the lady there is called Aisha Bello. She is Nigerian and she has already initiated by ladies in her country. They, I think, normally meet twice uh, every month. So it's a good thing. Like right there at that moment, Pi Ladies is having a workshop in, in that back room and she's having an interview outside. But yeah, so it's, it's a good initiative in case you want to empower women as well. Okay, so um, the next one is Jungle Girls Workshops. This is a very popular uh, something uh, <laughs> in our Python in our community. And uh, Python Jungle Girls they create Python workshops for women. Uh, they also have online tutorials for open source softwares. And um, the statistics say that since 2014, they've had 507 volunteers. They've also organized 252 events. They have been to 180 cities in 65 countries. They have trained 6,220 women. Okay, so this is something that is very popular and that has been uh, in many countries. So the reason why it's popular is because it's making an effect. So it's one initiative that has uh, been successful that we can also initiate in our African countries. Um, Zimbabwe, for example, has already had several Python uh, jungle, jungle Girls workshops in their country, as well as Nigeria. They've also had several Jungle Girls workshops and Namibia as well. So these are some of the initiatives that we can use in our countries to empower women. And we have Better's Jungle Ladies. One of them is uh, Anna Makaruzi. She's also from Zimbabwe, and she is behind all the Python activities that are happening in Zimbabwe. And yeah, so we want to see more Better's Ladies coming out or being recognized out of these uh, events. If you want to read about her, you can go to the Jungle Girls website and you will read more about her. In Namibia, we also have what we call Namibia Women in Computing Society. This society was initiated at the Python conference that was held this year, and we focus on empowering women 
or increasing the influence of women in the society. Our first um, challenge was to bring together 200 women for a conference for the Anita Bok uh, organization. Okay, so that was our first challenge, and that was the outcome. We brought so many women together. They were not 200, but they were that many. So these uh, encouraged us to have more and more workshops and conf conferences to empower women. Okay, so um, later on we also had, I think it's, uh, it was in September, this was in September, and this was a hackathon, gender-based violence hackathon that, was, that we also hosted. And normally this is a competition that is uh, every year, once every year, and it's for Android mobile app development. And normally, I think even less than 10 women participate in this competition. But this year alone, 60% of the participants were women. So these are some of the effects of our efforts that, that, that are happening in our country. Um, to have this outcome, it wasn't easy. We had two workshops before before this event, and one was to introduce ladies to Django, uh, to, um, I mean Android, and then we also followed up with them and we had an intermediate training. That was just to build their confidence so that we can have this outcome. So it doesn't just happen, we, we work for that. Okay, so also um, another result was that this year at uh, one of our universities called NAST, 51% of the graduates were women. So this is good, and that is in the School of Computing and Informatics. 51% of those people were women. So that's a good thing for us. We, we, we are happy about it. Um, one of our focus, other focus areas is the school outreach programs. Okay? Um, and at Python Conference, the very first Python Conference, we started the Python Namibia Society. This was uh, our very first meeting at the Python Conference still. <laughs> We actually didn't know what we were doing, we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into, but, but yeah. After this meeting, we, we were now lost to say, okay, fine, we are together, we want to create Python uh, society uh, events and so forth, but what do we do? Who, 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 who do we look up to? Which area do we focus on and stuff? And uh, one of the areas that was very important to us was children, so we had school, school outreach programs. We went out to schools, we spoke to the learners, we showed them uh, software created by Python just to encourage them to want to learn more and so forth. We also spoke to them about career choices in computing and all that. Um, yeah. So this year we wanted to be more involved in, um, uh, in our schools. We didn't just want to go and talk to them. We wanted to interact with them a bit further. And what we realized was that we, uh, we wanted to do more research. We wanted to do more research and know exactly how to help instead of just thinking for ourselves. When we did research with the schools, we realized that some of the schools were phasing out computer studies. And this was a big shock to us because in a world where everything is computerized, how do you phase out computer studies? So we wanted to do more research, and luckily enough, I got a job as a school teacher, so I could now experience everything by myself and not just here. Okay, so um, what we found out later on was that the two contributing factors to this phasing out of computer studies is a lack of qualified teachers to teach the course. Now in Namibia itself, teachers are, are few due to other uh, reasons, okay? So now in our case, because of a lack of teachers, there are two types of teachers that are, uh, that are employed who are not necessarily qualified as computer studies teachers. So they, they normally end up employing um, graduates from university either who graduated in IT or computer science now this person understands the concepts of computer studies. They understand the content, the curriculum and stuff, but they are not taught how to be a teacher. So they normally end up not really knowing how to deal with the psychological part of teaching. And this is very important when you are dealing with children and teaching children. So, um, so yeah, that also affects the outcome of the learners. And the other type of teacher normally is a teacher, qualified as a teacher, but maybe just an English teacher and they are forced to teach computer studies because there is no other teacher. This teacher is qualified as a teacher, they know how to deal with the psychological part of teaching, but they don't really understand the content. So at the end of the day, sometimes they don't understand how to explain algorithm. If they don't understand, they are not going to teach it. Because they are going to sound stupid if the learner asks them questions and then they don't know how to answer them. So this also affects the outcome of the learners that we have at the end of the day. Then the other problem we have is the no functional labs in our schools. 
There's practical things that you need to do in the curriculum, but there are no functional computers where you can do practice with the learners. So this is a big problem, especially in our um, government schools. Okay. Um, so at my school, where I teach, we also don't have computers. But uh, we have a small library, and I got some of the screens that are working from the library. And at the Python conference, we got eight Raspberry Pis donated to us. And because I'm the chair of PyNAM, I have the privilege of using the Raspberry Pis. So I brought them to my class. And normally, when we have practical work, what I do is those learn I encourage the learners that have computers at home to go and do the work at home. And then those that don't have, I stay after school, and we work on the Pis. We share the pies and we work on that. I'm also, um, I've also been lucky to have had a good relationship with our universities. So sometimes they also allow us to book their computer labs. So during the weekend, maybe like on a Saturday and on a Saturday or Sunday, I will take the learners there and then we'll do our practical work at the university. Okay, so also I invite some of my friends to come and help me because I don't think it's healthy for me to teach the children from Monday through to Friday and then the whole of Saturday and the whole of Sunday. So <laughs> sometimes I invite some of my friends to come and also uh, teach them a couple of things and so forth. Okay, and the result of this is happiness, as you can see in that picture there. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah. So I also like to encourage the learners to participate in other activities that are not just school related, just so that they see the picture outside of the classroom. And one of those such events is uh, conferences. Panam held a mini conference and my learners uh, gave talks at the conference. So, so yeah, so just to challenge them a little bit while we were struggling with the Django conference uh, workshop. Um, they also participated in the national high school competition, programming competition. And here seven schools participated in this competition and it was hosted by one of our universities. And our school won the silver medal. This is a school without computers, and how we learned about this competition was through a friend of mine. Now, this other teacher just uh, texted me and asked me, Jessica, are you participating in the programming competition at NAST? And I was like, which programming competition? And then she was like, no, we got a new invitation letter from the university and so forth. And I was like, I also teach computer studies at my school. Why didn't I get an invitation letter like you? So the following day, I went to the university, I inquired about the competition, and they gave me an invitation letter. I took it to the principal, and we participated in the competition. That was a month before the competition. They learned Python in a month, and they got second place without computers. <laughs> yeah. So this motivates me to work very hard for them. Um, yeah. So what is the way forward? in Africa or in other countries that have not had Python conferences yet. One of the ideas that I think is for us to have or to introduce an education stream at Python conferences. This is something that I've seen at PyCon UK and it was uh, amazing to me. Uh, what they had was like they would have a whole day just for teachers. So teachers and uh, developers would interact and teachers would tell developers where they don't understand or how they can be helped. And they interacted, you know, they, they worked on different projects and so forth. And to me, this was very interesting. I got a chance to participate in it. They also had a day for just the learners. They brought the learners in. They worked on um, Raspberry Pis and micro bits. So the kids followed some tutorials, they created some softwares, and then they presented these softwares at the conference. This was breathtaking. It was very, very nice. So I would like to, for us to also have such events at our conferences, even in the future and so forth. Just to encourage the teachers, also to train the teachers so that the teachers can train the learners. And at the end of the day, we'll have a bigger impact. Another thing that I would suggest is to encourage universities to be involved in society skills development initiatives. If there's no computer society at the schools, anybody who's at a university, I would encourage you to encourage the learners or the students to create such societies. And then if this, these societies have events, I would also encourage the universities, universities to fund this type of, soci of societies. Uh, with our university, we had a software carpentry workshop. Our university funded it. So it was possible because of them. They also have um, a robotics uh, project that they are working on. 
This is also encouraging women and other people to be involved in not just theoretical work but also technical work. And they are also working on uh, a, um, a program to train teachers all around the country. So I would encourage universities to, to support such initiatives. This is a picture of um, one of our doctors, professors working with the, with the students on the robotics project. And also, last but not least, to support each other. I looked at this picture and I was super embarrassed. This was a picture of some of the countries that uh, crowdfunded PyCon Zim. And as you can see, it's only Zimbabwe that funded itself. No other African nation funded that. And charity starts at home. So I would love for us to also support each other because we do have the money, but we didn't support our fellow Python programmers. So, so let's support each other. And thank you for listening. That's the end of my talk. So I just got, I've got a question. One of the things that I've found um, in trying to uh, teach computing and programming in um, schools in South Africa is that you have to get the teachers over the hump of the fact that the child will soon know more than the teacher. Okay, what do you do about that? <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> what I do is the following. Um, with my school, we started a programming society. So I don't work on projects with my learners. I just encourage them to do the things on their own. I just, <laughs> I just train them to start, but they know more than me at this stage. They, they would ask me questions that I don't have any idea about. So I, just, um, so I created a group as well, and on this group I have um, developers that are more skilled than me. So anything related to technical stuff, I have guys who will answer those questions for me. <laughs> so, so yeah, <laughs> you find a way to dodge this, this situation. There's, there's, so that, that's dealing with yourself in yes. that position. The harder problem is dealing with a teacher at a school who is not used to this, okay? And you're going to leave them with something, a legacy that they must take over. And often they don't want to teach this because they're going to look stupid in front of the class. So you have to help the teacher get through this. You're, you, you're talking about helping yourself get through this, mm. but you, now you must help somebody else get through it. So do you just tell them that story or what do you do? No, I think what we should do is have workshops for teachers. Keep them involved. Keep get, giving them more and more workshops. And if we did before, keep giving them also extra workshops so that their skill level also increases. And this actually motivates them to teach and not look stupid. Yes. Um, how's internet access at the schools where, where you're setting this up? Is, is it possible to teach the kids to just learn to Google? Because that's usually the best way to teach people to program because the way I program is like Google all the time. Um, at, at the school where I'm at, we do have internet access. It's super, super slow. But in order for you to encourage someone to go to Google, they have to have a computer. And that's the problem that you have at the school. No computers. So we need to find a way to fix that. <laughs> yes. Um, the the crowdfunding you were talking about, oh, Zimbabwe. Well, uh, uh, I've never heard of it myself. But the thing, um, have you guys tried to do it in in Namibia? And uh, how did that go and stuff? Like that? Okay. Um, for to to raise funds for our computer labs. Yes, the, uh, you you talked of the the the, the crowd fund when you showed the map. Yes. And you said Zimbabwe funded itself. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to do the same thing in Namibia? To raise funds for our computer lab. Yes, to raise. No, we have not done a crowdfunding for ourselves, but we we me and the learners came up with an idea of having a computer day. Um, we are hosting this day, it will be on, in, on the 4th of March next year. And on this day, I have asked the learners to give software development, software ideas. So I divided them into groups and we have started working on, on their ideas. 
So we'll be developing their ideas and they will be presenting these ideas on that computer day. That computer day is to raise funds for potentially funding our computer lab. So we'll be selling tickets and having other activities that we have planned to hopefully, and ask for sponsorships to hopefully fund our labs. But we have not done a crowdfunding. Um, <clears throat> so mine's less of a question and more of a statement. Uh, I just wanted to say that what you're doing is incredible and I look up to you a lot after this talk. I will definitely be in contact. Um, that t-shirt actually there is Amunia. I'm very proudly getting it up and running again. We teach Python to kids here. So I'll probably contact you about stuff. But what I actually wanted to say was we gave you a, a round of applause for your talk but I'd really like to give you a round of applause for actually what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, two questions. So the first question is um, skills acquisition is the first step in empowerment for um, groups that are underrepresented. Um, in your opinion, what is the next step? I mean, what can people use? Like once you've learned to code, um, how can you use it to empower yourself? And um, or what kind of challenges and supports, um, in your opinion, is needed in order for people to maximize the, the usage of their skills? Um, mainly our focus area has been on, on children. Um, hopefully encourage them to get into um, in the computer studies sort of stream once they are done with the uh, school mm -hmm. and they will be challenged further or they will have they will still keep increasing their skills you know further on mm -hmm. um, and also with our women initiatives mostly we have trained women who are either in, in the um, in the industry or their students so we we don't we didn't have we have not had a challenge where we trained the people and they didn't know how to expand their skills because they are still in computer science. So they, they, they do have um, uh, activities that will force them to um, learn more, I guess. Okay, so um, so once you've learned how to code and you, if you've you know, finished university, for example, um, what kind of support systems are there for people who wish to go into industry um, or people who are already in industry who, who experience challenges because um, of the like, you know, chicken and egg thing of being underrepresented. Um, do you know what kind of? Not at the moment, not in my country, not, not that I know of yet. Mm, mm, okay. um, we don't have any support system after, you know, teaching you. Mm. Not that I know of. Okay. Um, the, the other question is, have you had experience teaching programming in different languages? And um, like, what, have your, what are your experiences doing that, if you do? Like, is teaching programming different in English um, than in like Oshwambo? Like, is that different? Like, how do, do people learn better in certain languages? Um, I have taught Visual Basic before to our first year students. Mm -hmm and also Python now to the school learners. Um, the difference is that when you are teaching Visual Basic, normally you don't focus on, on what the on algorithm, on what the program is actually doing. So it takes so long for a person to actually catch what is happening. Mm. Uh, but with Python, it's easier to begin with. But to keep the learners interested becomes more difficult because now they don't see the graphical part of of the programming language and they want that. After they have learned the basics, they want to see an application actually running. They want to see music sounding. They want to see all these funny things. Yeah. But with Python, it's difficult to get there. It's a whole discipline to just learn, you know, um, GUI and so forth. So it's, it's a long way with Python. They will, they will catch the content, the, the basics of the language mm -hmm. quickly, but to develop it from there, to make it fun from there, mm. becomes a challenge. I think the question was more about the, uh, the mother tongue that you're speaking rather than the computer language. Um, uh, how I would relate the two would probably through practice. Mm. If I'm learning a new language, I need to practice a lot and a lot and a lot. Mm. Um, that's the only common thing I see also in a programming language. Yeah. So you, you keep 
teaching them, giving them exercises, or like a lot of them, and then you know they catch quickly. But I don't know about anything else. I've never taught a language, language, natural language. So. Okay, so so do you usually teach in English, or do you usually? Okay, that's yeah. really interesting. English. Okay. I'm really interested in like the data of um, maybe people teaching in the like sometimes a lot of kids learn in their second language like was there a difference between learning programming in your second language versus in your home language is that an advantage like I'd be really interested in in data on that um, but thank mm. you very much I also I also like the um, that you said there's different challenges when you're teaching kids um, different programming languages and you know like keeping kids interested is is different for Python and virtual basic. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Can I, on your first question, can I give a really, really shameless plug? Uh, in the next talk, I hope to address a little bit about how we use uh, technology to empower communities. No, that's the one. Um, <laughs> are you giving the talk on stream processing? Okay, um, so yeah, uh, how we use technology and and handling data, but uh, and programming if necessary to to empower communities. Uh, I think the education one is a big one, and the way we address that is um, largely with hackathons and exposing technical people to non-technical people, usually domain experts or journalists. But um, just throwing that out there. What I see a lot is that there's a lot of initiatives that that educate, but there's but the the representation remains remains low. So yeah, I mean I'm interested in the entire in the entire pipeline from skills to retention. Yeah. Hi, hi. I just had a question about your use of uh, Raspberry Pis. Seems that you were able to bypass the lack of computers by using Raspberry Pis, and do you think that this is perhaps a model for um, other countries or other places which lack access to computers? I think so because Raspberry Pis are cheaper. Setting up a computer with the Raspberry Pi is cheaper, but it's a challenge in my country because unless, yeah, because um, Pis normally run on on Linux. And we are testing our learners on Windows. So unless we can install Windows on that Pi, uh, it's still not going to be very useful to us in our case. But it's, it's, it's a cheap setup, so I think it's, it's good. It's good. Thanks. Uh, so my, <coughs> my question is simple. How can uh, we and our companies help? Like, have you... Uh, are you running any programs where you need sponsorship of Raspberry Pis? Like, basically, how, how yeah, how can we help? Um, the best thing would be to to get in touch with uh, the Python Society. We run several workshops of several events, like this PyCon Mini that we had, where we had learners represent uh, present uh, stuff. We, we did it, but we didn't have funding from anybody. So it would be good to be involved with them, and maybe if you, if you are interested in just funding the society for their activities, then you would do that. Or if you rather have them give you a proposal of what they are doing and you fund that particular event, then that would also be uh, welcome. But it's, it's needed. It's needed. Um, so, using Raspberry Pis to teach kids um, to program is—are there some advantages to that? Do kids become like less, like more responsible with things like algor algorithmic complexity and like memory usage and stuff? Because the the computers are such are so like low resource. Um, do you think that that's a cool thing to leverage when you're teaching kids programming? Because um, a lot of the times, I don't know, when I first learned how to program, like, I, I wrote very, very inefficient code, but are kids forced to write more efficient code on Raspberry Pis? I'm not sure if I get your question, but um, we don't use Pis to motivate them to write better code or for them to uh, 
be interested in coding, mm. we use them as a computer. Okay. So just as a training resource. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. oh, right. As a training resource. Okay. So yeah. the code doesn't run on the pies. It does run on the pie, but we use it as a computer. Okay. So we don't really break it down or go into what's in it or whatever. We just use it as a computer in our case. Do kids ever realize like if they write code a certain way, it runs much, it like takes much longer to run on the pies than, than if they wrote it in a different way? We have not gone that deep, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they no. have. It. No. Okay, thanks guys. Um, and thank you very much, um, uh, Jessica. That's a fantastic talk and it's lovely to hear what's um, going on around um, SEDC and especially around um, teaching in Python. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>